So for this video episode of Pastime, I want to tell you about one of my favorite dinosaurs. Tyrannosaurus rex. That is one of my favorites, but not the one I want to talk about. Okay, so it's a long-necked sauropod dinosaur, one of the real giants. Oh, the giants are also really cool, but not a giant dinosaur. Triceratops, Stegosaurus. Nope, nope, nope. My favorite is Iguanodon. 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 No armor. Mm -mm. No horns. Nope. I mean, it has big thumbs up spikes on its hands. That's pretty sweet. Two thumbs up for Iguanodon. Not really a huge head, plant eating teeth. No. Iguanodon is not the most impressive dinosaur, I admit. But the animal you just described is what we know about Iguanodon today. But That's Iguanodon true. is one of the oldest named dinosaurs we have. It's one of the original dinosaurs. And the story of Iguanodon is the story of dinosaur paleontology, going all the way back to the beginning of how we tried to understand this world of giant reptiles living on the planet and how they moved around. Iguanodon has been the center of that story for the entire history of paleontology. And I take it we're going to tell that story. It's a great story. I agree. <laughs> The story of Iguanodon begins with this guy, Dr. Gideon Mantell, who was a doctor working in southern England at the beginning of the 19th century. And he's visiting a patient while his wife is outside looking at some rocks that are piled up where they're doing some road construction. She sees in one of these rocks a giant tooth. When she shows it to him, he recognizes it as a reptile tooth, but it's bigger than any reptile that anyone's ever seen before. And so he starts comparing it to all these other teeth and what he thinks it looks like is a tiny little iguana, like little teeth of an herbivore. But it's huge! And so Gideon Mantell knows that he has a giant reptile on his hands, but he doesn't know what the rest of this animal looks like. So he just calls it Iguanodon, meaning iguana tooth, because that's all he had to go on. So the story literally just begins with teeth. No bones about it. You made that joke and not me. I did. But teeth really aren't enough to go on when you're trying to build a whole extinct animal. You need way more than that. And Mantell got that in the form of a big block of rock that contained a partial skeleton of an iguanodon. And he recognized them as iguanodon because the block also had those distinctive teeth that he recognized from his initial discovery. So now Mantell has teeth of something that look like an herbivore because that's mm -hmm. what iguanas are. Yep. And he Pieces had... of the backbone, parts of the front legs, the hind legs, a whole lot more to go on. What's most exciting was that spike. Yes, that spike. And so Mantell, using this new discovery, offered the first reconstruction of Iguanodon. And it's weird looking. It doesn't look much like a dinosaur. No, it's got, you know, it's got long front legs, long back legs, about equal in length, so he's just running around on all fours virtually none of the head, but he puts that big spike on the end of the thing's nose. It looks like a rhinoceros iguana monster sort of thing. Not a lot like the iguanodon I was talking about earlier. With the information contained in this block, they finally have enough information to actually build a life-sized hypothesis of what iguanodon looks like. Yep. And so they do that at the Crystal Palace exhibition, which was in England, and it was kind of everybody was gonna show up and see these beasts, along with some other cool stuff going on in Victorian England that wasn't as cool as the first life-size dinosaurs. They also put other extinct animals in there. They had things like a giant Irish deer, and they had a giant ground sloth, but those animals they had more bones for, and people know what a deer looks like. If you get a really big one, you just make a big deer. Yep, there's a lot more guesswork in trying to rebuild something like a dinosaur, where we don't have anything that looks like it today. And so trying to put together Iguanodon was really trying to put together how a dinosaur is put together. And right now, they think it's standing on all four legs like a rhinoceros. And just like a rhinoceros as well, it's got a horn on the end of its nose. A really strange looking critter. For the next chapter in the history of Iguanodon, we travel to a coal mine in Belgium. At the bottom of the mine, miners discover the remains of many more Iguanodons than Gideon Mantell had ever seen. Entire skeletons! And a scientist named Louis Dallo, a legend of European paleontology, reconstructs these animals and mounts the skeletons for the very first time. 
And you would think because he has the complete skeleton that he's going to get it pretty close to the right animal. Like, well, for that, instance, he knows where that spike goes. It goes not on the end of the nose, but on the thumb. Iguanodon had this massive spike sticking out of the side of its hand. And whether it's using it for just approving of things or slamming into predators, we don't know. But now we know where it goes. And what he also knows is that the front legs of Iguanodon were a lot more delicate than the back legs. Mm -hmm. This is an animal carrying its weight on its back legs. Yep. And it has this huge tail sticking out the back. And the only animal that's around today that's really easy to see how it moves, that has a big tail, long back legs, and short front legs, is a kangaroo. And so Louis Dallo reconstructs his Iguanodon skeletons to look like a kangaroo, rock back with their tails on the ground, and, and their thumbs given the thumbs up all the way through Belgium. So the Belgian Iguanodon is like kangaroo Iguanodon. And they start doing that with every dinosaur. It's yeah. kangaroo T-Rex. If, if you walked on two legs, it was a popular thing to do in the late 19th century and the early part of the 20th century. Tyrannosaurus Rex, the, the duck-billed dinosaurs, everyone was standing up, hind legs down on the ground, their four legs up like this, walking around like a kangaroo. But then that changed. That did change. A lot of research in the latter half of the 20th century, beginning around the 1970s, showed that the muscles and the bones of dinosaur backs were really better suited to being held horizontally off the ground, with the top of the back sort of paralleling the surface the animal's walking on, instead of being kinked up all the way almost vertically like these old kangaroo iguanodons were. And so these muscle reconstructions are used as the basic piece of data, but then paleontologists start pulling from other areas. That's right. They look at the footprints of dinosaurs. Footprints of animals that were very close relatives of iguanodon, if not iguanodon itself, showed that these animals walked on two legs, and there are no traces of the tail in between those two legs. And if the thing is walking like a kangaroo, its tail's dragging on the ground. So you're going to see some trace of that, but you don't see that. And in modern trackways, an animal like a lizard or a crocodile, you see his footprints, and then in the middle you see that tail drag. But that's not the case with almost all of the records we have of two-footed dinosaurs, Iguanodon included. And as a result, we have to update the reconstruction again. So now in Belgium, with all the mounted kangaroo-like iguanodons, they've put together a modern interpretation of how a guanodon walked around. And here you can see he's down on all fours with his back ramrod straight. We went from four-legged rhino-like iguanodon to two-legged kangaroo iguanodon, but now he's back again on all fours. And what's really interesting to think about is that scientists have found a lot of close relatives of iguanodon that suggests that the animals in this family were really diverse in how they looked. Some of them were really, really hefty and powerful, like Iguanodon itself. But some of the others were relatively slender and slim-bodied. So we're not sure which ones walked on all fours, which ones walked on two legs with their arms just above the ground. There's a whole lot of mystery still to be resolved about Iguanodon and its family. All right, so this story of the history of Iguanodon is really the history of dinosaur paleontology. As we learn a little bit more, we start to put together a bigger picture of the biology of these extinct reptiles. And we're not done. We don't know what kind of skin Iguanodon had all over its body. We don't know how many eggs it laid or how big babies were. We have lots of mysteries that still have to be solved about this animal. And there's been a relatively recent revolution in the way we depict dinosaurs. Like, we recently learned yep. that carnivorous dinosaurs were covered in feathers. And some people look at that, and it's like, that looks really I, weird. I know, I thought it looked weird. I did, I too. Started. Like, when I first saw it, it's like, they, they just, they look like Muppet dinosaurs. But the evidence tells us they're covered in feathers. Yeah. It just builds and builds and builds. That's the way paleontology and science works. And Mantell knew that his first work on Iguanodon wasn't the last word on this magnificent animal. Yes. In the original publication in which he described the fossils, Dr. Mantell says, Imperfect as are the materials at present collected, they will be found to possess sufficient interest to excite further and more successful investigation that may supply the deficiencies which exist in our knowledge.
And Gideon Mantell described Iguanodon as an extraordinary animal. And I think you'll agree, after all of this, that Iguanodon really is an extraordinary animal. Well, I actually always thought it was. I just want to see how you react if I was saying that. Uh, ah! And with that, my name is Matt Bortz. I'm Adam Pritchard. And we'll see you next time on Pastime. All right, so how do you think that went? Two thumbs up. I'll do the pinky out, though. Oh. That's a more accurate reconstruction.